welcome to the September 2021 episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast. I'm Lisa Louise Cook. Do you feel like you connect with your ancestors on a spiritual level? Author Lori Erickson does, and she's here to talk about her experiences that she shares in her new book, The Soul of the Family Tree. In our DNA Deconstructed segment, your DNA guide, Diane Southern, is back to help answer the question, why do ethnicity estimates change? In our Best Websites for Genealogy segment, we're going to look at how Facebook can help the genealogist. And then we'll wrap up the episode at the editor's desk, where Family Tree Magazine digital editor Courtney Henderson has got an excellent new online resource for you all about free genealogy. But first, let's start things off with some tree talk with social media editor, Rachel Fountain. Family Tree Magazine's social media editor, Rachel Fountain, recently became Rachel Christian, thanks to her recent marriage. And she's here to share some conversation from the magazine's Facebook page about another marriage, one that took place 150 years ago. Welcome, Rachel Christian, and congratulations. Hi, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very exciting. And um, you have now your own marriage certificate. But this article that you shared on the Facebook page was actually coming from People Magazine. So a 150-year-old marriage certificate makes it into People Magazine. Why is that? Yeah, it's um, a great story. It's been circulating for a while. Um, at first, it was just in like local news outlets, but this past week, it ran in both People and the Washington Post. It's a great story. Um, yeah, a 150-year-old marriage certificate was found inside a frame at a thrift store, just a thrift store picture frame. Hidden in the back, there was this incredible document, and it has since been returned to the couple's great-granddaughter. Oh, so, it's the type of story that I know genealogists love. So Exactly. Yeah, and that's not really that uncommon in although I think it's uncommon these days to find things like that, but um I think it would have been more common, you know, 150 years ago to tuck a very um precious document that you want kind of protected in a safe space and I guess right behind the photograph is a very safe space. Yeah, and I you know, we've heard stories like this before, so we went on Facebook and we shared the article, first of all, and then we asked our followers if they had ever discovered anything interesting um, behind a picture frame. And we got lots of responses, one of which our follower, uh, Valerie Johnson, she said, a young man found my relative's baby picture that was on a postcard at a thrift store. Her name, age, and weight were written on the back. Um, She was in her online family tree, so the person who found it messaged her and returned the photo to her. She received the photo in 2019 and the picture was taken in 1919. So she got a 100 year old genealogy treasure that was found at a thrift store through the kindness of the person who found it, so. Yeah, those people willing to go a little uh, little extra step, you know, to, to reunite people and their objects. Yeah, you got a lot of comments. What else were people saying about that? Oh, they didn't specifically talk about finds from a picture frame, but they talked about finding treasures at flea markets and thrift stores and places like that. I mean, anything from, you know, old letters to military service papers, wills, baby pictures, just all kinds of things. And it's, I think, really a genealogist's dream to receive something like that, but also to find something and return it to the original owner. Yeah, it's so cool. And We're lucky that we have tools like Facebook and other social medias now where we can, you know, connect with people and return those objects to, you know, the families that they belong to. Absolutely. And we will be talking about how to use Facebook for genealogy in our upcoming segment here in this episode. So uh, a great way to kick off the episode. Thank you so much. And of course, if you want to join in on the conversation with Family Tree Magazine over at Facebook, you can do that. Just go to at Family Tree Magazine, and you can share your finds and help inspire others as well. Thank you so much, Rachel, for sharing such a wonderful story. Thank you. Have you ever found that tracing your genealogy has actually deepened your spiritual life? 
author Lori Erickson has been exploring this idea in her new book. It's called The Soul of the Family Tree, Ancestors, Stories, and the Spirits We Inherit. And she's here to talk about it. Welcome to the show, Lori. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Lisa. This is a a really interesting book, and you have been kind of on your own fascinating family history journey. I got the sense in reading through the book that did you kind of start at the point of testing your DNA and what prompted you to do that? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm one of those people who came to an interest in genealogy fairly late. Uh, It wasn't something that I grew up with. People in my family were not naturally interested in family history. And so My interest was really prompted by losing a number of close relatives and realizing that I really wanted to learn more about people who have gone before me. And so I started with an ancestry test, um, in part because it's so easy. You know, all you have to do is spit into a test tube and there you go. Exactly. Now, did that eventually launch you into doing more traditional records research? Were you working with the Ancestry Family Tree Online? How did that expand out from DNA for you? Well, it was a great start because there was so much material that I had I had instant access to, and I found that very helpful to stimulate ideas on where to go next, uh, especially linking to other people's family trees. Because as I said, I didn't have a lot of material in my own immediate family and ancestors. And so I sort of piggybacked on other people's research to start with. But I think what one of the one of the images that was so striking to me from the very beginning was that image of just sitting in front of my computer and seeing my monitor filled with this incredibly ornate web of connections stretching out you know, much, much farther than I had ever realized before. And that metaphor really became the central one that I play with in my book about the web of connections that links everybody in the, in the past, in the present, and in the future through our descendants. Right. And you were saying in the book that you grew up in a, in a hometown, is it Decorah, Iowa? Yes. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that this was a town with strong Scandinavian heritage, there was kind of heritage around you, but that wasn't really resonating with you. Did that change as you were starting to explore? Because really, I hear you uh, talking a lot about the theme of, of heritage, even more importantly, over individual ancestor connections. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Decorah, Iowa is probably the most Norwegian American town in the United States, strongly, strongly uh, Norwegian in its background. Uh, And growing up, you know, I took it largely for granted. And it was only after I started my genealogical search that I I really became fascinated not only by my own family roots, but by the cultural transmissions that I had received. And also the, the ways in which Scandinavian heritage plays a role in larger American culture as well. Um, In our language, the English language has a lot of old Norse words, for example, Uh, in our stories, our popular culture from superhero movies to uh, J.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, which has its roots in Scandinavian mythology. And so my individual search for roots really expanded to a much larger uh, looking at the ways in which this heritage, this ancestry has influenced the larger country as well. Yes, they definitely made their print. And you (laughs) went out and you started uh, exploring, kind of trying to immerse yourself in this. Tell our listeners some of the experiences. How did you kind of try to bring this to life for yourself? Well, one of the things I did, I I pretended to be a Viking woman at a Viking reenactment, a Viking festival in uh, Minnesota. That was so much fun. I'd always wanted to do something in the reenacting field, and this was a great excuse to do that. Um, I traveled to Newfoundland in Canada, which is the site of the only authenticated Viking settlement in North America. That's where the explorer Leif Erikson, who was of Norwegian descent, almost certainly landed around the year 1000. And I went to Norway, of course. Um, Mm -hmm. I went with my children, my sister and my husband. And I found the farm where one of my ancestors had been basically a sharecropper in about 1840s. Um, I went to a small town in, in Minnesota that is the site of a famous hoax relating to 
uh, of rune stone that was was found there that supposedly was left by the original Vikings and almost certainly wasn't true. But the story tells a lot about the role of myth making in ancestry research. Um, I did a lot of reading. I read um, a number of the Icelandic sagas, which tell the story of the settlement of the colony in Newfoundland. So in all sorts of ways, I I tried to really sort of dive into everything Scandinavian and see what's what stuck, what sort of related to my story, what gave me insights, and also what was a good story to tell then to other people in my book. Right. I, I've been to the um, Viking Museum in Oslo, Norway, <laughs> and they have this tremendous kind of multimedia um, color extravaganza that happens on the ceiling. And you, you yes. can't help but walk away mm-hmm. from there and just feel the immenseness of the stories of the sagas. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it does kind of touch your soul a little bit when you get the sense of what these people endured, what they did, uh, how brave mm-hmm. they were, how uh, ruthless sometimes they were. <laughs> uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. You, you talk about ancestors kind of evolving into being a guide for you. So what was the spiritual connection for you? What was your experience? And, and what do you kind of mean by the idea of our, our ancestors guiding us? Well, it's actually a very old idea, this idea that ancestors uh, continue to watch over a family. It's found in many different cultures across the world. In my case, it's also part of the Viking culture, Old Norse culture, this idea that spirits could be passed down in families and, and that these were sort of guardian spirits that took an interest in the people and they could be lent to people. Actually, that was a really interesting idea from the old stories. And so that's one part of it, this ancient idea, the influence of ancestors. But in another sense, as a writer, I've always been interested in the intersection of travel and spirituality. And one of the things that became very clear early in my research is that a, a family roots journey is a type of pilgrimage. And by pilgrimage, I mean a trip that changes you, where you come back different from what you were when you started. It's a trip that you reflect on often for years after having taken it. And I think that fits perfectly with many, many people's experience when they search out the places where their ancestors lived. And so in my book, I examine issues of identity and meaning. What, What does it mean to have an understanding of what your ancestors endured and what their spiritual beliefs were? Uh, in my book, I became fascinated by one woman in particular who lived around the year 1000. Her name was Gudrid the Far Traveler, and she straddled the pagan and the Christian world, the old world and the new world. And she really became a kind of, of model for me on how to, to live gracefully in a time of transition, of spiritual transition, among other things. So I think there's all sorts of ways in which genealogy can be a spiritual quest. And and I think people don't pay enough attention to that. And so that was one of the reasons why I wanted to write my book. Interesting. What was one of the most surprising things that, or maybe something that you um, experienced yourself and you kind of, it surprised you the impact that it had on you? I think it was being at the, uh, the reenactor festival, the Viking festival to feel how, how um, powerful it was to wear clothes from that from around the year 1000, and, and of course they're recreated clothes. Um, but you know to wear the simple shift that a Viking woman would wear with the two brooches at, you know on your shoulders, and and just to spend a couple of days wearing that, and then to be around people who were dressed in similar fashion. I think anyone with a sense of imagination can can see that that gives you a kind of experiential, visceral sense of what it was like to live in the past that is really hard to get if you read a book uh, or if you visit a history museum. Uh, so enacting, uh, enacting um, part of my heritage, I thought, was surprisingly powerful. Now, uh, I know you. your last name is Erickson. I'm guessing you married an Erickson. Is that right? Well, actually, I kept my maiden name. Oh, that and is your so maiden name. Okay, that is yes. Uh huh. Yep. Mm-hmm. My husband has a different last name. So, and he's a, a traveler as well, is he not? Mm-hmm. Yes, he is. He is also a very good sport. Uh, he went along <laughs> on pretty much all the research, except for the Viking festival. He sort of drew the line at that uh, and dressing <laughs> up like a, a, a Viking. 
Um, but otherwise, I think he also became more interested in his his ethnic heritage as a result of my, all of my explorations. He's German and Polish primarily. Um, but I think, you know, it's it's sort of, you know, it's catching when you when you know someone who is having so much fun and learning so much. I think that that sort of enthusiasm can spread. It's interesting. That's why I was asking about your, your surname, because I was wondering if you have other ethnicities in your background, or if you were strictly Norwegian, and in your husband joining you on some of these, did this expand your genealogy research out into other areas? And kind of what's in the future for your research? Well, one of the one of the things I found out my initial uh, DNA results were oh, like 85% Norwegian and a little bit of Swedish and, and Celtic. And, and so I wrote my book and then as it's it's set in print and I can't change anything, I get a refinement of my DNA analysis. And it says I'm 100% Norwegian. And so I am, I, which is really quite amusing, I think, because my ancestors have been in this country for like five generations. And right. so they they made sure that they married other norwegian americans and so i am i am not very ethnically diverse and so it's sort of norway uh for me um but i do think i'm an anomaly in the united states and that most people have this wonderful mix and one of the points i make in my book in fact is that because most people have this mix you really can choose an area to focus on you know, you, you can't research everything but you can follow a thread that really intrigues you. And, you know, history is a big place is one of the things that I say in my book. And so, um, you know, it's, I think it's a wonderful storybook that's waiting for people to discover once they start doing a little bit of digging. Are there any threads that you had to leave behind in order to get the book finished and get that off on your publication date? Are there any that you want to pursue? Yes, I'm actually quite intrigued. My, uh, I chose two ancestors to follow through the book, Hans and Silla, who emigrated in 1850. And Hans had a child uh, that he left behind in Norway. Uh, oh. She was about 10 when he, when he emigrated. And then he married for the first time in the United States to someone from that small village. And I, the people who were helping me do the research ran into sort of a brick wall about this young girl, Anna was her name. And I'm very intrigued by her and about this idea that of the people who are left behind. And it's, you know, it's, it's, I think that's part of the immigration story too, of those who stayed. And so I'd really like to find out more information about her and if she stayed in contact with her father, if he sent money back, you know, if they corresponded, you know, what's the rest of her story? Right. Well, that would be a fascinating one to pursue. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel now when you re return to Decora, Iowa? Does it feel like a different place to you? Do you feel well, more it connected? does. I does. I think because whenever we travel, I think what we experience is so much a result of who we are. And yeah. so I feel like I'm a different person now. I see layers more. So little things like in this town, there's Viking, a real estate company named the Vikings, which I thought was is so funny now because knowing more about the history of the Vikings, you realize they're like the last people you want to put in charge of your house sale, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Or there's a there's a construction company called Ragnarok Construction, and Ragnarok was um, this old Norse belief in the apocalypse that will end the world. And again, I'm not sure you want to name your construction company after that, but but you know maybe maybe it does sort of fit if you're doing you know demolition, I guess. So and also I think I look at the countryside differently because I look at it through the lens of having been in Norway and to see it through the eyes of people who had grown up among mountains and fjords, and then to see that countryside, which is beautiful in its own way, it's rolling rural countryside, but it's not mountainous, you know, it's not right. fjords. And to have this sense of how much these people left behind and how hard it must have been for them. Mm -hmm. I'm not Norwegian myself, but I did grow up in the Pacific Northwest and we had many okay. people from yes. Norway. Uh -huh, and and uh -huh. that would be an area where I could totally see the attraction that they've, mm -hmm. I'm sure, much more felt like coming right. home. It's right. amazing how adaptable people are. <laughs> well, that's right. That's right. And I think, you know, the, the Scandinavians in general were, were a hardy people. They were used yeah. to harsh weather and uh, hard work and making do. 
And I think that they were resourceful wherever they ended up. Well, so interesting for you to, to kind of lay out this journey that you have for the reader uh, in the book. It's called The Soul of the Family Tree, Ancestors, Stories, and the Spirits We Inherit. And uh, Lori, I'm sure they could pick this up at Amazon. How can they find out more about you? Uh, my website is net, and I have a monthly newsletter that covers my work, but also interesting developments, themes, and the category of spirituality and travel. And so I encourage people to sign up for that as well. You can do that on my website. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Family Tree Magazine podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. Well, in this episode's DNA Deconstructed segment, we're heading back to ethnicity results. And we're going to check in with Diane Southard to get all the latest. Hi, Diane. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for chatting with me about this. It's still top of mind for most people. Absolutely. And and this, we're going to talk all about ethnicity results. You wrote an article about that over on the website, familytreemagazine.com. So first and foremost, what can people do with ethnicity results? You know, the more I think about this and the more I answer this question, the more excited I get about this ethnicity result product. I feel like it used to be uh, not very helpful, right? It used to be like (laughs) um, not very uh, precise and it used to be kind of vague and oftentimes it gave you even kind of wrong information. But all of that is really changing because of the technology that the companies are working to create, as well as because of us, because there are more of us testing and more of us who are contributing our data to this kind of research within each company. And so it's getting really good, actually. And so knowing that things are improving and and just kind of moving forward, um, when somebody gets their initial test results back, they're getting these ethnicity results, what can they do with them? Yeah, so I think we always need to make them our first stop. So looking at your ethnicity results should be the first thing you do when you're looking for an ancestor. So for example, I just did a mentoring session with a gentleman yesterday. So in the mentoring, we go over their results and we talk about what they can do with them. And so I'm chatting with this, with this gentleman and it was fascinating actually to look at his ethnicity results. So his DNA test was taken. They were looking for clues to uh, find some great grandparents. And, you know, he, they knew a lot already about their family from this part of the world, from this part of the world, but there were all of these ethnicity results that didn't fit with what they knew. So they had some Scottish, they had some French, and they had some some Asian that all were kind of unaccounted for. And I was like, well, this is our first stop. Let's let's look at this. Let's think about what this could mean or what an ancestor that has these ethnicities would look like or whatever. And so we start walking down this path and it turns out based on DNA matching now, because then we turn to the DNA matches and we try to find information there. But really amazingly, we identified his two times great grandparent as a person who was born in France married someone from Scotland and then lived in Singapore. And then that person, their, their child who was born in Singapore married an Asian and then created this person, this ancestor that we were looking for. Anyway, it was fascinating. And I was like, this is exactly what your ethnicity results are supposed to do. They're supposed to kind of plant in your mind some hints some kind of background that you can be looking for within your DNA test results so that you can then recognize, wow, this was actually an important part of my story. And now I can figure out how this integrates into my family. What a great example. It's it's so much more than just looking at your matches, but the idea that it gives you those clues um, and it, everything's there for a reason. So of course, that brings us then to the, the question, we want to get the very best ethnicity results we can. So which company has the best estimates? Yeah, that's a great question, right? And it really depends. That's that's the honest answer. It depends on what you're looking for. 
Each company has different population groups that they have assembled and are are able to evaluate. So it's important for you to understand which populations each company is evaluating. But in general, the three kind of neck and neck winners are MyHeritage and Ancestry and 23andMe. They have the largest reference populations and they have the most robust algorithms that are giving most people the best results. Ancestry and MyHeritage also have the advantage of a new kind of technology that helps you associate your family history with various groups. So at MyHeritage, they're called groups and at Ancestry, they're called these communities. And these are very specific, often associated with different migrations of different people. Um, for example, my mom's family is from their, their very specific group of people who are German speaking Russians who then migrated from the Ukraine to North Dakota, right? And so this lap they made essentially Germany, Ukraine, North Dakota, that is reflected in both my heritage and in ancestry, very specifically it tells me that I have ancestors from this community of people who trace that exact migration path. And that is just incredible. I just, I still can't get over that, that my DNA is telling me that much detail about my family history. So it's really exciting when you get those communities and groups from my heritage and ancestry. Wow. So what I really hear you saying is it's not just getting a good quality test, somebody who can, you know, have the results for you, but really the technology, the, it's the website, it's what you're looking at after the results come in, that you can really work with some great data. And so that's something to look for too. Well, if you're looking for the best ethnicity results, go check out Diane's article. It's called DNA Q&A, all about ethnicity estimates. And we will have that link in the show notes. Always great to talk to you, my friend. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks, Lisa. Good to talk to you too. If you use Facebook, you might be surprised to discover that a lot of people are using it for family history. And that's why it's on our 101 best websites for genealogy list. There's a couple of different ways that you can use it for genealogy. The first would be, it's a great way to connect with family, maybe distant cousins that you've lost track of. By simply connecting with those people that you are related to, Facebook has a way of discovering through those connections, who else you might be related to. And very likely, they'll be suggesting these people to you as friends. So every once in a while, it doesn't hurt to go and check the suggested friend list. It's also a great place to look for living people. And of course, your current living relatives may just have the kind of information that you're looking for. So tracking down perhaps distant cousins, uh, people you haven't seen for a while, and just reconnecting through Facebook might be an opportunity to then ask questions about family history, share photos. You never know how where it could lead. Facebook's also loaded with tons of groups devoted to genealogy and history. In fact, it's a great place to learn more about ancestral locations. In my own case, um, I joined a Facebook group that was devoted to the history of Margaret Kent in England. And this is a location where my husband's family lived for generations. The group offers an opportunity for anybody with an interest in Margaret to share memories, share photographs, old postcards, historical finds, whatever. It's amazing because you could go to an archive, you can go to a library, but these are unique memories and items that are perhaps held in just one person's scrapbook somewhere on the other side of the, of the world. And it can all come together through a Facebook group where you're sharing a common interest like a location. So using keywords like genealogy and history, along with uh, surnames or locations, that's a great way to discover these kinds of groups and pages. There are also groups that might even be able to help you find long lost family heirlooms. In fact, not long ago, I got an opportunity to interview one of the organizers of one of these groups. And here's that conversation. If you've ever wondered if you'll ever find that lost photograph or an old family Bible, or maybe it's your great-grandmother's bronzed baby shoes, 
Carol Kid Osborne and her Facebook group may just help you make it happen. The group is called From Shrubs to Trees, a pay it forward genealogy group. And here to tell us more about it is Carol. Tell us what is the goal and the purpose of your Facebook group? Well, the goal and the purpose is just to get, you know, that lost memorabilia back to, if not a direct descendant, you know, at least as close as that we can get to a direct descendant. So, you know, we we have a good number of people that are like-minded, that love doing this on the side. It's all Facebook family people. Um, you know, usually what I'll do is I will, uh, if I see something in another group where somebody might say, hey, I have this, I don't know what to do, I'll let them know that, you know, we have this group. It's, we get that to the families and they'll join and I just have like one really quite good question that's it are you involved in genealogy just because we have a love and want to see that stuff go to somebody you know that's that's in the genealogy field most of the time because we know they'll take care of things right (laughs) (laughs) exactly so when you first get an item you probably have a, a basic research process. Where do you begin, and does it vary a lot by item? It just really does depend. Now, I myself will go pretty much straight to Anstry and start digging in there. So usually we can find people. Now, granted, there has been one or two instances where the items are not that old, from the 60s, let's say. And sometimes I will search on Facebook to see if I can find them on Facebook. A lot of times I will go to, like, the white pages or those type of websites to see if I can find a name or an address. One in particular was a lady that's probably my age that her baby picture was floating around out there. And I was able to track her down within 30 minutes and get it back to her. It just... Wow quite amazing. That was probably the quickest one I've ever done. (laughs) She was thrilled, of course. (laughs) I remember one time I picked up a photo album and it was at a garage sale and I did some research and I found somebody locally who had it and I contacted them and they said, yeah, I don't want it. That's why I got rid of it. Do you ever get that kind of a response? We have. Not too often, but we have had that. And my best advice is just go down to the next person in line. You know, sometimes we do, and people are always amazed that somebody doesn't want that family heirloom or, but yes, we try to get it to somebody. It might not be direct, it might go out a couple generations, but we have had that problem before. And it's sad, but some people that just don't think like the rest of us (laughs) hold on to that. Well, I imagine when you find people in online family trees, of course, you're finding somebody who's put the tree there because they're interested. And if they're looking for family, then they're yeah. probably very interested. I'm interested to hear one of your favorite success stories inspire well, us with all this. This happened a few years ago. And it was just, I mean, it just gives me goosebumps. I had purchased some letters that were written in the 1950s from a soldier to his fiance, And kind of read through and it kind of feels a little strange to, you know, kind of take a little snippet out of their life. Yeah. But I was able to find that they had gotten married. I found their daughter, and they were clear back in Pennsylvania. And she said, how did those letters ever get out to our area? Well, come to find out, he had passed on. The mother had Alzheimer's. So when I sent them, she sent me a letter back saying, I cannot thank you enough for giving mother back a part of her history because she didn't remember. So that one to me was just, you know, it just goes right to the heart. But that's really my favorite one of all. Well, and it's exciting when you can find an activity that you love to do personally, but also is really making a difference in the lives of other people. I mean, you're probably reaching people in that family, even possibly for generations to come and not even knowing who they are. Yeah, when you read something like that, you just kind of burst into tears because yeah. it's personal yeah. and meaningful. So, What's your success rate? How is it going? And, well, and I'm curious, kind of maybe what kind of volume of things are you working on at any given time? 
I would say, well, our our success rate, we, we are not even two years old yet, and we've sent back over 1,600 items. Wow. So I think we've done a fantastic job. Volume-wise, it, it kind of comes in spurts. You know, we have a big flurry, and then it kind of gets a little quiet for a bit. But I don't know. I would say maybe we get three or four a week that come in that post their photos, and we sit down and help them with it. I'm just so thankful and proud that that. Now, are most of the things that are getting posted where people are saying, okay, folks, here's what I found. What do you think? Um, are those other researchers in the group? Because I know you're in a sense a closed group. You have to join the group. So if somebody had an item, but they're not currently working to help you identify them and they're not necessarily looking to do that, can they still somehow contact you or get the item oh, to you? Definitely. I have an email address they can email me at or a message me over Facebook or, you know, just post the picture and we'll just jump right in and start working at it. Yes, there are a lot of people that are just there to see if they can find family. Mm-hmm. And, of course, everything is digital, so that's fabulous. Mm-hmm. But, yes, they, they can contact me that way. Even though I work, I will usually get back with them within 12 hours or so if, if it goes that long. <laughs> Great. What do you do with items when you can't find the family or the descendants? Well, sometimes they just sit there. You know, and at least it's there in case someone comes on later and are looking. You just never know when somebody's going to pop in there to find something. And sometimes we'll go back to old stuff that's kind of stalled and rework it because information has come over that period of time that we didn't know about to begin with. So that is usually how we deal with those. Sometimes they'll sit there for a couple of years yeah. before a beep, something pops up and we can get it sent. Right. I mean, every day something new gets posted on one of these online services or trees or new records. So mm-hmm. there's always hope, right? Yeah, there is always hope. That's what I tell people. Don't give up hope. <laughs> All right. Well, it's Shrubs to Trees, a Pay It Forward genealogy group on Facebook. You've been hearing from Carol Kid Osborne. And Carol, you might get some more people who are interested in maybe helping as well as providing items. Hopefully well, many what? more will get reunited. Yes, the more the merrier. (laughs) Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me. This has been great. Well, as we wrap up this episode, of course, we're going to stop by the editor's desk. And today, Courtney Henderson is there. She's the digital editor. And she's got a great new resource page for you over at the Family Tree Magazine website that's going to help you find your ancestors for free. Hi, Courtney. Hey, Lisa. Boy, you've been busy as usual, and uh, I see that you've got a a great new resource page, and this looks like it's free. Tell us about it. Yeah, so I put together this resource page for our audience. It's completely free for anybody who wants to access it, and it's almost like a mini ebook, but it's all online. And my idea was to take some of our different articles that we have about finding your ancestors for free and put them all on one single page and just kind of briefly go over the highlights of each article. The idea is to take these different ideas that are around a central theme and put them all in one post. So I decided to focus on how to find your ancestors for free because who doesn't want to save a little money? And I feel like we've all gotten a little complacent with ancestry. And yes, we pay we pay for that convenience, right? We pay for being able to search records by keyword. But it is possible you can dive into some different records for free. You just have to do a little more digging. So my idea was to show our readers how they could do that. Terrific. And you've covered some important areas. You uh, kind of have it, like you said, like an ebook, a table of contents here at the top of the page of this article and um, kind of six key areas. What were those areas? Well, I started off with free genealogy websites just because that is a huge search term on Google. I pay attention to that kind of stuff as part of my job, and people really want to know where those free genealogy websites are. So I focused on that first, and I included a giant list with links, as well as some more resources at the bottom. And then I went on to separate out more of the popular websites, those free features for Ancestry, Family Search, and Find My Past. Great. And then you've got 
Uh, number five is even more genealogy, uh, free genealogy records, and of course, free genealogy software. I think I helped with some of that, didn't I? You sure did. Yes. <laughs> And it was really fun. I used some of your article and then I researched a little bit and found some new options for our readers so that they can check those out as well. Terrific. The uh, article here is how to find your ancestors for free. It's got six great chapters. I'm going to have a link in the show notes so everybody can find it and check it out. Make sure that they are getting all the freebies that are out there for them. I see under the websites, you have a lot of different genealogy websites who all have free content. So this will be great to get this on our radar. Thanks, Courtney. It's a wonderful resource. Thanks so much, Lisa. I'm so glad you joined me for this September 2021 episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast. It's the show from America's number one genealogy magazine. Now, while you're here listening to the podcast, would you do us a favor and give it a positive rating here in your podcast app? That really helps other genealogists find the podcast and take a listen. So we really appreciate that. And then be sure to check out the show notes for this episode. It's familytreemagazine.com slash podcast. And there you'll get all the information about everything we talked about and the website links. Thanks again for joining me. I'm Lisa Louise Cook, and you can visit me at my website, genealogygems.com, where you'll find the Genealogy Gems podcast and my weekly video show at YouTube, Elevenses with Lisa. Until next time, have fun climbing your family tree. Mm-hmm.